a year since the controversial evacuation flight out of Afghanistan was accused of putting dogs' lives before that of the humans trying to flee the country. And after a year of backlash last night in a brand new documentary, former Marine Penn Farthing, who led the mission, finally lifted the lid on what really happened. And Penn joins us now. Good morning, Penn. Good morning. Good morning, how are you doing? Yeah, we're very good, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Penn, uh, first of all, this all started uh, once you'd served in Afghanistan as a Royal Marine. In the documentary, you say that you found a dog, it became your friend, because obviously being in a uh, theatre of war, it's not a nice place to be, but you found a dog as kind of uh, a help to get through what you were going yep. through, and then you went back to rescue the dogs that couldn't come back to the UK or the United States with the troops that had served there, is that right? It is, yeah. I mean. Once I rescued that first dog, then I had other soldiers who messaged me and say, well, actually, I'm looking after a dog or a cat. And how do I get it out of Afghanistan? Um, and so that is how the charity started. And then it evolved into um, this amazing um, organization that was actually helping the Afghan people by preventing rabies being spread through the stray dog population. And then, so, so last night, the documentary uh, Animal Airlift aired on Channel 4. Um, I watched it. It was kind of... It, 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 when you watch your journey and that whole process, it really is a sort of roller coaster of emotions. You can see just how emotive that whole period of time was to you, and I'm sure still is. What do you remember from that day that the Taliban took over? I mean, my biggest memory of that day, I mean, we honestly, you know, we knew that it was going to happen sometime in the future. And then suddenly we get reports that the Taliban are at the gates of Kabul. Um, and I remember sitting there in our, like, um, communal office area and one of my young female Afghan women who worked as a veterinarian, a lady called Hamida, who was in the documentary, um, she just sat there absolutely terrified, just shaking. Um, you know, as far as she knows, her life is now over. She's, you know, she's had this freedom. She's been through the schooling system. And now she's just got to, you know, potentially be locked away in the home. She's never going to be able to work again. And she will just end up being married off and having children. And she was just sat there absolutely terrified. And there was nothing I could do to console her or to help her. And that, that will always live with me, that moment. The Nozad charity was, uh, or is a charity, that helped gather together all the stray animals, the cats and dogs, <laughs> off the streets of, of Kabul in Afghanistan. And you uh, healed them, you made them better, you cared for them. And uh, what happened was, when the Taliban came into Kabul, you guys were, right, how do we get out as a collective, all the vets, and how do we get the pets, the dogs, out of Kabul. And that's how the whole campaign mm -hmm. started. You started on social media, which was a really powerful thing, and you were really passionate and really inspiring to get mm -hmm. the animals out of Afghanistan. And it, and it went to the, the top of government, didn't it? It did, yeah. I mean, but we started on social media because we had no idea how he actually talked to somebody to try and, you know, discuss our plan. Um, and so social media seemed to be the only way that we could get somebody to actually, you know, engage with us. Um, and we had no idea when we started it, where it was going to go, um, you know, and how much, you know, support we would actually get. We, we didn't even think that far ahead. We just, you know, we've got to do something for our staff. Um, and we were bringing the animals with us because clearly we were taking the staff who cared for the animals. So we had to bring them out and they could go in a cargo hold. So to us, it didn't seem controversial. It just seemed like the right thing to do. And and as as Vern said at the time, that was your sole focus. How do we get out? How do we keep you know these pets alive and and get everybody out of here? At the time, the campaign really picked up. You you know you gained so much momentum, raised support, tens of thousands of pounds. raised so much money, and then the dial turned. What happened? Mm -hmm. Because then that's where the controversy began. I think, you know, and looking back on it now, and obviously I've had a year to, to really reflect on it all. I mean, obviously that tagline, pets over people, as soon as that came out, that became the distraction from what was, you know, an incredibly horrendous time for the people of Afghanistan. But also it showed that, you know, the government, the Americans, no one had actually thought through this plan of what they would do. And so we became that smokescreen. It was a just a massive distraction and that tagline for us, you know, th that really came to bite us because people suddenly forgot all about the 67 people that we'd started 
Operation Arc 4. All it was was this, you know, Marine trying to get a load of dogs out of Kabul, which, you know, that wasn't what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So what happened was you managed to raise enough money to charter a flight. Uh, you were given permission by government to leave Afghanistan, to leave Kabul with uh, your staff and the dogs. Uh, but you couldn't get a call sign for the plane to actually land at the airport. And that's where things got really mm -hmm. emotional, Penn, where you're badgering uh, politicians and Boris Johnson to just give you a call sign. What was it called for the plane that you needed? You needed the... the... So it, it was an ISAF number because ISAF number, um, it, yeah. Kabul became a military um, you know, airfield. And so you can't just land a commercial plane at a military airfield. It needs to go through the military system. Um, and so whilst we were told, yes, you can potentially get your people on an aircraft, no one would actually give us the details of how we could land the aircraft. Um, and it kept getting pushed back. And we knew that eventually the, you know, the British military would cease operations because they were sadly, you know, tied to the Americans who we knew were going to leave at the end of August. So it became very desperate. I mean, they never gave us permission until two days before they ceased operations at Kabul Airport. I so think, it was touch and go all I, the time. I think, Penn, for us, I, I watched the documentary last night and, and for us watching, it seems, and I'm, and I'm sure to you at the time when you're up in this, it seems like a no-brainer. We've raised the money, we've got this flight on, just let us fill the plane and let us land it. And there was a moment watching it that was actually a hard watch last night when you can see this empty plane that seats... 200 or, or whatever it is and it's just you feet, yeah. just just you and a dog you know and it's it, it's it's quite hard to watch we've got a little clip here is that is that true they wouldn't let you put anyone else on pen we we asked so many times and we said you know by obviously the contacts we then had with the government with the um, social media let's fill that plane we only had 67 staff so plus me is 68 so we had all those spare seats and we kept saying, let's pop people on it. You know, we've got no dramas. You pop who you want on it. It took off with just me on board. Obviously, we haven't I mean, had time or we haven't had madness. a response from government about the situation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, it, that, that's gut-wrenching, seeing that picture. It really is. Uh, looking back now, um, it's, it's a long time, I guess, since this happened. What are your, what are your feelings? What are your own personal emotions? Yeah. How, how are you feeling about the situation, Penn? I mean, I, with all of obviously the negativity, it became you know, incredibly depressive, um, you know, last year for the last it's got nine, ten months. Um, and I lost sight of actually what Operation Art was all about. And now, you know, here in England, we've got 67 Afghans who are now 70. We've had three little babies born um, who are going to grow up with, you know, this amazing opportunity. They're never going to be forced to you know, do something they don't want to do or for the young girls just to live in the home and not be educated, not have those choices of what they want to do. And to me, you know, now I totally nutty, just focus on that. You know, we got those people out to start these new lives away from oppression mm -hmm. and actually, you know, do whatever they want, you know, and they could, we've no idea what these young kids are going to grow up to be. Absolutely. And so for me, that's the focus now. And, and the dogs that you did manage to get, you get home, as you said, it was just you and your little pup on that plane, but underneath, you did manage yeah. to bring all of those pets home. What, what, what does that look like for them now? Where are they now? Right, so a lot of those dogs and cats that we actually brought back were owned by people who had also fled the evacuation on the earlier flights. So they weren't just our rescue dogs, they were actually, you know, other people's dogs and cats that they had out in Afghanistan. So. Once, obviously, the dust has settled um, and all the dogs have been through the correct you know, quarantine procedures, etc. we then started rehoming them or reuniting them with their owners. And then the ones that were ours, um, as a charity, we've been rehoming. So um, all of our cats have been fully rehomed. We've got um, just a handful now of the dogs and they're, sadly, the older dogs. Um, and any rescue organisation will tell you it's always really yeah. difficult to find an older dog at yeah. home. Um, but, yeah, you know, out of those 94 dogs, the you know, majority now, they're all in loving homes um, around the UK, France, in Holland, um, and some in America. Uh, Penn, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank really appreciate, appreciate it. Good luck with everything and all the best. Yes. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yeah, former Green, uh, Green Beret. Ryan oh, fascinating. And, yeah, and the documentary is uh, it's available now on all four. And I, it's, it's, a, it's a hard watch, but it's an interesting it one. Those shots of, of people scrambling onto planes oh. and hanging onto planes as they're taking it's, off. It's horrible. Just, yeah, horrible. ridiculous.